And as you can see, this is a, a hybrid virtual and in-person event. I also want to uh, note that this event is a mix of a class session for the Lead the Way Durham seminar, uh, which is a hard class where we've been thinking about community engagement and civic participation in Durham, as well as a public event. So welcome to you all. I'm really delighted to see you and I'm glad that you're here. Um, I'm also really honored to be able to introduce Jillian Johnson. As I said, Jillian is the mayor for contemporary of the city of Durham. She is in her second term uh, serving on Durham City Council, having first been elected in 2015, re-elected in 2019 on a platform of racial, economic, and social justice, police accountability, equitable development, broadening democracy, and centering the voices of those most impacted by the issues facing us. Julian is an organizer, an activist, a board game designer, um, which is like maybe one of my favorite details about your, your biography, uh, mother of two. Her extensive commitment to civic engagement also included serving as North Carolina State Advisor to the Movement Voter Project, co-founding Durham for All, which works to build a multiracial cross-class political coalition, and board chair of the Southern Vision Alliance, National Executive Committee Member of Political Progress, She's also a fellow member of the new class of 2003. Uh, and so it's wonderful to see you again after almost 20 years, which every time I have to say that out loud, I convince myself it's true. Uh, so Jillian, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, the mic is all yours. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to be here with y'all and y'all for coming uh, to learn a little bit more about PB here in Durham, um, which has been one of my favorite projects um, that I've been working on as a council member and brings together a lot of my interests around um, civic engagement, community outreach and organizing, um, and really allowing people to have a voice, to have a say in how democracy functions and how public money is spent here in Durham. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about me, but I want to save most of our time um, to answer y'all's questions and um, talk about anything that you might be interested in about the program. Um, so I uh, moved to Durham in 1999 to go to Duke, spent a lot of time in that very building <laughs> uh, on campus. I was a public policy major, um, graduated in 2003. I grew up in Virginia, uh, mostly in the suburbs outside of DC and the suburbs outside of Richmond and spent one year, my senior year of high school in Chicago, um, which was quite different from suburban Virginia. Uh, and then and then came to Duke. And so I had gotten involved as an organizer um, pretty early in life. The first campaign I ever worked on was to try to get our um, GSA, our Gay Straight Alliance at my high school recognized by our administration. Um, and this was back in 1996, 97, when GSAs were kind of a new phenomenon and um, you know, we, we didn't have gay marriage and it was a little bit more precarious in terms of um, that recognition of LGBTQ folks publicly um, and our school refused to recognize our group. And so that was my first experience of organizing a community, you know, rallying around something, researching uh, relevant state and federal laws and getting petitions signed and doing all that stuff. Um, when I was a senior in high school, I joined the labor movement. I went to a nurses strike in Gary, Indiana with one of my friends in the middle of the night and we chalked the streets and we brought donuts and coffee and hung out and talked to striking nurses all night long and played with their kids and um, that really got me hooked on the labor movement. So when I came to Duke, uh, I was part of building our national student United Students Against Sweatshops chapter, which was an organization on campus that was working to um, make sure that anything that was licensed, any apparel, clothing, or um, bags, you know, Duke, anything with a Duke logo on it was produced under uh, safe and fair working conditions. And then we also worked with campus employees around living wages, union organizing, um, and fair and safe working conditions on campus as well. Um, after graduation, I've worked primarily in nonprofit organizations and um, been a board member for a number of nonprofit organizations here in Durham and have stayed involved, um, stayed involved with the labor movement, got involved in a lot of um, housing justice organizing here in Durham as 
Durham has continued to grow and gentrification has become more and more of a concern for our communities, got more and more involved in housing justice work. And that was really the work that led me to run for office. Um, and I first ran for office in 2015. I was asked by other organizers and movement folks in town to run. Um, and despite having a degree in public policy, it had never actually occurred to me to run for office before. It was not something that uh, was on my was on my list of things to do or even on my radar as a possibility. Uh, but sometimes other people know you better than you know yourself. Uh, and I was talked into it by a very um, a very committed and effective group of friends who essentially applied peer pressure until I agreed to run uh, and then ran my campaign. So, you know, I had a camp, I had 10 people on my campaign team. They were all experienced organizers. They ran a political campaign um, like you would, you know, like you would run an organizing campaign and we were able to to win um, a seat. And then I ran for reelection uh, two years ago. So I have two years left in my second term. Um, Participatory budgeting was one of the first things that I started working on as a council member. I actually started working on it before I was elected. I was part of um, a racial justice organizing collective that put together in the first year that I was in office a demand for a people's budget. And part of the people's budget demand was that a small percentage of the budget would be put before the community for community input and a community vote. Um, What's exciting about PB is that no matter how much budget engagement you have, it's always pretty far down on the engagement ladder. So, you know, when you when you think about like a ladder of civic engagement at the bottom, you have just telling people what you're going to do. And then in the middle, you know, you have opportunities for them to give you feedback or um, or express their um, express their opinions, tell you kind of how they feel and maybe make a few changes. And then at the very top of that engagement ladder, you have people having the opportunity to make decisions for themselves. And PB is the only process in the city of Durham that actually lets the public vote and directly decide how we spend public money. Um, for the first year of PB, we put $2.4 million of city capital improvement money into the pot. And so the capital improvement fund pays for things like um, park improvements, road improvements, sidewalks, uh, transit improvements. And so a lot of the proposals that we got were for those things, community centers, parks, um, technology for Durham Public Schools, some technology for Durham Housing Authority. Uh, and the process was that for a couple of months, everyone who lives in Durham, who is 13 years or older, could submit ideas. Um, and we... Sorry, should I keep going? I couldn't tell if somebody's asking a question. So yeah, keep going. Okay, um, so everybody who lived in Durham who was 13 years or 13 years of age or older, regardless of your citizenship status, um, could participate in the process. And we did a couple of months of idea collection. So we had an online idea collection portal where people could just log in and give us their ideas. We also had idea collection events that we organized with community organizations and with youth. And through this whole process, we're trying to center um, equitable engagement and equitable decision-making, primarily focusing on communities of color and low-income communities when we are when we're putting out our engagement resources, because we know that low, higher income people and white people are going to participate, even if we don't invest in engagement in those communities, because they already have the resources to engage. And so we put pretty much all of our engagement resources into, um, into communities of color and low income communities in Durham. So we do this idea collection. We had a special idea collection session with young people um, under 18, which was really great. And then kind of the meat of the work happens next where we have community volunteers who serve as budget delegates. And we had about a hundred people who worked with our staff to take the, the ideas that we felt were feasible, vi potentially viable proposals and turn them into fully fleshed out um, proposals with budgets attached so that people could actually look at them and decide uh, and, have, and have a good sense of what that project would do, how much it would cost, and compare them with the other projects and decide what to do, what they wanted to vote on. Um, 
Then the next step is voting. So we had voting open for about a month um, and we did voting both online and also with tables at the Food Lion, at community events. Um, in, in, sorry, middle schools and high schools, we had teachers and guidance counselors and other school staff, especially history and civics teachers, have their students vote in the classroom. And we were able to uh, encourage teachers and encourage the school district to make PB a part of the curriculum for, um, especially for high school, because we, we set the voting age at 13 to make sure that anyone who's in high school could participate. And that also ended up including um, a good chunk of middle school students, about half of our middle school students were able to vote as well. And then the final step is implementation. So we have online an implementation dashboard where all of the projects that were voted on in, um, in PB cycle one are listed, and then we're tracking the progress of implementing those projects. Most of them were, were city infrastructure projects, um, you know, improving crosswalks, bus shelters, parks, etc. Um, but some of them were also programs to help nonprofit organizations do different kinds of improvements or other agencies. So we had a grant to DHA, a grant to general public schools, a grant to Habitat for Humanity to put in ramps for um, disabled habitat residents. So a lot of a lot of different things, but all really all like infrastructure related. For our second cycle, which happened during COVID, we wanted to have a more direct response to the pandemic. It felt a little bit outside of people's um, everyday experience to be like, well, let's you know do all these city infrastructure projects and and improve city infrastructure when a lot of when our communities are really struggling and there's a lot of need out there for pandemic relief. And so what we did. For our second cycle was um, first we cut the budget and we put only a million dollars into the pot, but we we made it available as grants for nonprofit organizations during COVID relief grants of up to $50,000. So nonprofit organizations submitted proposals, they were worked on by budget delegates and vetted by staff and then went out to the community for a vote. And so we gave um, a number of grants to nonprofit organizations, 20 something grants to do work that is directly related to, um, to the COVID pandemic. And so we'll also be tracking um, the implementation of that work, though it's a little bit trickier because since we're not doing it ourselves, we're kind of, we're giving the money to the organizations and then we're asking them to give us reports about, um, about what they're doing. So now we're in the evaluation period for cycle two and uh, planning for cycle three. We do PB every other year and in between we do this like implementation and evaluation year. We decided to do that because when we looked at other cities, we found that a lot of PB projects that had been approved by by residents, by voters, weren't actually getting implemented because of a lack of capacity at the city to both run the process and implement the projects. So we're staggering that. So we only actually do the voting process um, every other year. So now we're in the planning for cycle three, and we honestly don't really know what it's going to look like. Um, so I feel like some kind of hybrid between cycle one and cycle two uh, is a possibility. You know, there there were pros and cons to doing the infrastructure route, and of course pros and cons to doing the nonprofit um, grant route. And, and so we'll kind of just have to figure it out. Also, the situation with COVID is so much up in the air. Like we don't really know where we're going to be um, in a year when we would when we would start thinking about, you know, actually putting into place the, the plans for the next process. And so while, you know, while we're hoping that we'll be all the way back to normal, we're also keeping up the... Um, making sure we can continue to do online engagement and other virtual engagement. We did do some in-person engagement for cycle two, um, you know, masked and outside, canvassing at the bus station, those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, of course it, it's hard in the pandemic environment to do the kind of resident engagement that we usually do, which is everybody come into like a big high school gymnasium and we're all gonna talk about um, how we make the city better. It's been, it's been tricky to figure out how to do that during, um, during COVID. Some of the obstacles that we faced, um, because it's a competitive process, there are people whose projects don't get funded. And it's, um, we have had some, some pushback, some criticism from those people of the process. And we've had just some general dissatisfaction that we've had to, had to work to overcome. The goal of PB is to be radically inclusive. Um, and so 
we really try to make sure, like we, we really want everybody to feel good about, about the process. We want people whose projects aren't selected to continue to participate, um, to support other projects, but that, you know, that can be hard. That can be a hard sell when you applied for money and you didn't get it. And now we're like, but you know, we really want you to stay engaged. So we've had, um, that's been, that's been a challenge. Um, of course, the you know the online engagement has been has been a challenge um, in the COVID environment, as I as I was saying, and then some we've had some implementation challenges too. Some of the organizations that we have worked with, um, we've we've had to figure out how to make sure that people are clear on the front end how the process is going to work. Um, we've had some some struggles with like the. The city is only legally allowed to fund certain things and the city is only legally allowed to do contracts in certain ways and that's you know public funding isn't always familiar to small nonprofit organizations and while we try to make the process as accessible as possible there are some legal barriers that we are forced to to honor and recognize and so we've had some challenges with um with understanding and with collaboration with organizations when those things haven't been made clear up front or when they're just not used to dealing with all of the barriers that can exist um, with regard to public money. Uh, so, um, you know, it has not it has not been a completely smooth process by any means, but I think it's been really successful. We have um, been used as a model for PB processes in other parts of the country. Both I and a couple of members of our staff have been invited to international conferences about participatory democracy in order to present PB and talk about it. Um, this kind of process is a lot more common in um, other parts of the world, Europe and uh, Latin America in particular. And so having this kind of a process in the United States and especially in the US South has been um, has been unique enough that we have been uh, that we've been asked to to come and talk and and to give advice and uh, and counsel other other people who are starting up PB processes. Um, Andrew asked me to talk a little bit about other avenues for resident participation and civic engagement, um, and so I'll just talk a little bit about some of the other engagement processes that we have going on right now. The city is redoing our comprehensive plan which despite the term comprehensive is only about land use. <laughs> it's comprehensively about land use um, and trying to figure out, you know, how we develop the city of Durham into the future. We have a fundamental conflict between wanting to be um, wanting to be sustainable and to develop in an environmentally conscious way that doesn't uh, that doesn't increase um, suburban sprawl and negatively contribute to climate change, while at the same time being in a position where our population is growing so rapidly that if we do not add housing to our housing stock as quickly as possible, people will be priced out of will be priced out of Durham and are already being priced out of Durham and will continue to be priced out of Durham and it's a very urgent crisis. Um, our affordable housing providers and rapid rehousing providers tell us that it is almost impossible to find affordable housing in Durham anymore. People with Section 8 vouchers have a lot of trouble finding landlords who will rent to them. And so we are, you know, we are caught in between these two, uh, these two very important goals. And the re comprehensive plan redo has become a space where we are discussing and thinking about, um, about all of those things. And we're using a process that is defined in our um, what we've named an equitable engagement blueprint, which was developed two years ago by our neighborhood improvement services department. Uh, at the request of city council to make sure that when we are doing community engagement, we are prioritizing the voices of people who are going to be most impacted by the decision, and particularly people whose voices have not been traditionally been able to be heard by local government, people of color and low income people um, in particular, but also people with disabilities, LGBTQ folks, um, and other people who are who have been marginalized from our political process. Um, we're also using that blueprint to do engagement around our transit plan. After the uh, failure of the most recent light rail project, we are trying to think about what's our what's our plan for expanding and enhancing local transit as well as what's our long term plan for regional transit. And so there's some equitable engagement happening around the transit plan um, with that model. And then um, there are other 
processes that we do or have tried to do in the past. One is a community conversations program where we brought the city and the county and the school district all together to talk about city issues. Um, a couple of my colleagues and I are working on a neighborhood level engagement program that we're hoping to launch in the next year or so that would go out to specific neighborhoods and invite people to engage um, with council members. So those are some of the other ways um, that we're doing engagement around around other city issues, the budget and like the budget sort of sets the stage for the entire year, right? So we do a lot of engagement that's focused around the budget, but there are also all these other things that we're doing that we want to make sure we're engaging people on. And then, of course, we've got this American Rescue Plan funding um, that we are about to receive. We have, we've already received actually about $26 million from the federal government, and we'll receive another $26 million in 2022. And so we're trying to figure out what the best way um, to engage the public around, around how we spend that, I mean, truly unprecedented federal investment in, in Durham. I told someone recently that the ARP is the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> Don't tell my kids. Um, but it's, I mean, it's just, it's just incredible that we would get that kind of, of federal money and we are able to, it's, it's not completely flexible because no federal money or public money is ever completely flexible, but what we can spend it on is pretty broad. Um, it has to be related to the pandemic, but any kind of economic or social ramification of the pandemic is, is fair game. So we've got, um, we've got a lot of proposals, a lot of ideas for, for what to do with that money and and we'll be doing a, a robust community engagement process through the rest of this year to try to figure that out. Um, I think I've answered all of the questions. I'm happy to um, take more questions or um, more topics that y'all want to talk about. Oh, and I was also asked to explain what is a mayor pro tem, which is a really good question. And it's a really weird thing that I think only exists in North Carolina and a few other places. Um, it's a position where you're elected to city council and then elected mayor pro tem by the council. So you run as a city council member and your colleagues, co the council essentially picks someone to act as mayor if the mayor were to be unavailable. So that's my, that's my job. Happy to take questions or if people want to know more about any particular thing. Yeah, thank you so much, Lydia. You opened up a lot of avenues, I think, for us to explore about Durham and all of the work that council is leading here. Um, folks, I mean, I've got a few questions, but I want to make sure that um, y'all get your questions answered first. So does anybody have uh, something they want to ask or an area you want to explore further? I'm curious about the relationship between the uh, American Rescue Plan and the Durham Rescue Plan. Yeah, they're, they're not the same process. So the $6 million is an additional $6 million that we are programming into our capital improvement plan, which is um, a 10-year plan for uh, city infrastructure investments. And so the goal for that money is to invest in infrastructure in um, low-income Black and Brown neighborhoods that have been traditionally neglected. So that the, the process for that, we have not actually... Um, we don't we don't have a defined process for that yet. Um, how we're going to how we're going to figure out how we spend that six million dollars? We have kind of a broad criteria, but um, but we don't have any engagement or or a plan for that yet. The twenty six million ARP money, there's already an engagement process in place. We've had two or three events, and our staff are continuing to and and we have an application process. So groups have submitted proposals. And our staff is vetting the proposals and then we're going, we're going back out to the community for more um, for more engagement over the next couple of months. Can you tell us more about the, that $6 million, the equitable infrastructure, where that came from? And then you know, it was narrated in the press a certain way that I think was probably different from how city council intended it. So yeah. Would you mind yeah. On that? Definitely. So we are hoping to, over the next several years, invest significantly in improving infrastructure in uh, in communities where infrastructure has been neglected. And that's largely due to how de to development patterns um, in the city over the last 
50 plus years that have been shaped by racism and racist public policy decisions um, going back to, um, you know, going back to restrictive covenants and urban renewal and redlining and white flight. Um, so we have a lot of communities in Durham that have not received a lot of private investment over the years and have not received a lot of public investment. Um, we have been talking about infrastructure bonds for a while and wanting to figure out a way to do a good infrastructure bond that would um, allow us to build some pretty critical, provide some pretty critical needs in a lot of neighborhoods. Sidewalks is something that comes up a lot. Um, a lot of the older neighborhoods in Durham don't have sidewalks because at the time those neighborhoods were built, they were not required by um, by the city. Now, new developments that are built are required to have sidewalks. So the inequity has been created where older neighborhoods that are um, that are more affordable also have no sidewalks and these newer, more expensive places have sidewalks. Um, sidewalks are incredibly expensive. They cost a million dollars a mile and that's before COVID. I honestly don't know what they cost now, but more. Um, and so, you know, for a $50 million bond, that's 50 miles of sidewalks. Like we actually need more than that even. Um, also our transit system is a huge priority as we continue to see gentrification taking place in the, in the center city. More lower income people are, be, are being um, forced to live further out from jobs and schools. Uh, and so having a more robust transit system to get people where they need to go is a big priority for, for this kind of infrastructure bond. And so when we discussed infrastructure needs at our last um, in our last budget process in, Mar in May and June of this year, we decided that we wanted to have a more robust community process around whether or not to put a bond on the ballot, similar to what we did with the housing bond in 2019, and that we hadn't really done enough engagement yet to ask people to vote for a bond in for this election in 2021. So we just used our existing budget authority to add $6 million um, from, our, from our debt fund to our budget. And that's what we'll go for um, to these projects. We definitely don't call it reparations. I think reparations is a very specific thing. Um, and I think Sandy Darity actually over at Duke has defined it really well, uh, direct payments to the descendants of enslaved African-Americans. It's not building infrastructure in neighborhoods that are majority black. I think reparations is just a hot topic right now. And so people want to call any investment in communities of color reparations. Um, in my opinion, this is just what should be happening anyway. Rep Reparations is, um, in my opinion, reparations is a much bigger process. It's trillions of dollars, and um, and the city doing this sort of thing is is reparative, but I would not call it reparations. But I think that you know that's a broader sort of political and social discussion argument that people are having right now. There is an Asheville um, infrastructure investment that they did call reparations. And some people liked it and they also got a lot of flack for it. So, but yeah, in, in my opinion, the Sandy Darity definition of reparations is correct and this is not reparations, but it is great. Other questions? Uh, I was wondering, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear, can you hear me? I can, yeah, I can mostly hear y'all. It Sometimes it like breaks up a little bit, but I can, I can catch it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, my main question was, what do you think the correct balance is between the government and the people, especially when it comes to participatory budgeting? Because I love the idea of it, and I definitely think it's important that the people do have a say, because, and that it's a very democratic process. However, like, I was wondering what you thought about to what extent it's really feasible to give the people this power, and at what point does the government or just um, an overarching authority body step in? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and we had conflicts kind of related to that, like what's the right balance based on what the city is legally able to do and, and helping people to understand what the city is legally able to do. In general, I think we did the right thing, which is to create a framework around the decision making that the public is allowed to do, but then be really flexible within that framework. So our PD manual for our first cycle laid out in really specific terms whose decisions which decisions belong to which body of people. So which decisions were gonna be made by city council, which decisions were gonna be made by city staff, 
which decisions were going to be made by the PB steering committee and then which decisions were going to be made by popular vote. And so the, you know, decisions that were going to be made by city staff, for example, anything that our city attorney's office felt was not legally um, could not be legally implemented under our city's charter authority, they had veto power over those proposals. Um, and then the city council is actually the final decision making body like we we are pledged to honor the funding decisions of the community led process, but that's not actually legally binding, we then have to um, approve all of the contracts, certify the results, those kinds of things. So there is always a check, a government check on the participation. Um, but the but the goal is to allow as much demo democratic participation as possible within like the legal standards and guardrails that we are forced to put up by virtue of you know being the fiduciary of public money and being responsible for how public money gets spent, making sure it's being spent um, in ways that are in ways that are good, that are productive, that actually help the community, and that are legally allowable and aren't going to get us in trouble with the general assembly. Um, so so. Def, you know, definitely tried to strike that balance and be really explicit about what the balance was so that we didn't get halfway through the process and people were like, well, I thought this was community driven. Why won't you let me vote on X? And it's like, no, this is very clearly laid out that this is the decision of city staff and city staff has veto power. Um, there were some there were some organizations that were not happy with us because we determined that their projects were unfundable legally. Um, but that's, you know, that was an important part of our process, making sure that everything we did was um, was fully transparent and fully allowable um, and wasn't going to cause any any legal issues or raise any red flags for anybody about what we were doing. Okay, there's a question in the chat. I should also say folks that are joining us virtually, please feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, Roy, well, yeah, yeah. I noticed on the web there was 134,000 spent on technology and DPS. Given that the legal responsibility for education is under the county, can you explain the links which PV might uh, between Durham City and Durham County? Yeah, happy to. So that was also a little bit controversial. Um, there were there was one council member and a few folks who were concerned about the city um, taking on what is legally a county function of funding education. Um, we worked directly with Durham Public Schools though on the process around, you know, making sure that their students can vote. And we vetted before projects went onto the onto the ballot, we vetted them with um, with school district officials and with county officials to make sure that everybody was okay with what we were doing. At the project, um, the technology for DPS schools actually is a good example of how a community process and um, and a governmental review can can lead to like a, a hybrid outcome that's actually really great. The idea that was submitted for um, the idea that was submitted for the proposal was to provide laptops for Durham Public School students, um, and it got you know it was people were really interested in it. Our budget delegates really liked it, but when we talked to the school district about it, they told us actually we're good on laptops, what we really need is projectors. And so we were able to change that proposal from, um, from providing laptops to providing projectors and pick schools in each, uh, in each district that were, that were most in need of the technology. And so as long as, long as the lines of communication are open and everyone um, feels good about what's happening, I'm not concerned about, um, about any kind of turf issues or like, should the city be funding the schools? We also, we're doing another um, round of support for the schools actually with a little bit of uh, CDBG money, which is community development block grant funds. We just at our last work session uh, approved a, a um, approved an allocation to Durham Public Schools related to COVID pandemic relief and our, and our CDBG money. So we partner with DPS and with the county often. We do interlocal agreements to fund joint projects and things like that. Um, there are, I, I would not want to be in a position where the city is obligated to continue funding the schools and so the county um, we're, so like the county keeps kind of puts that responsibility off on the city and we are scrambling for money or like trying to raise taxes to do that kind of work when the county is the one that should be scrambling for money and raising taxes to do the work. There's kind of a question on whether Durham should really be a separate city and county because, 
90% of people that live in the county also live in the city. And there's a there's a lot of opportunity for um, efficiencies if we were just to merge the two governments. There's been a lot of talk about that. There's been a lot of roadblocks that have come up and then those talks have kind of fizzled out. But it's something that we talk about all the time, like why do we have two entire governments to run, which is essentially the, <laughs> the same community, the same, you know, um, and there are other there are other places that have where where there is really one city in the county, unlike you know Wake County that has a ton of municipalities. Durham is pretty unique in that the city of Durham and the county of Durham are are you know almost the same political entity. Um, so we're we collaborate and work together a little bit more than I think um, is typical for like a city county relationship. Uh, is there uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. So you talked about the different cycles of PV and how there are these really great um, built-in years for reflection and evaluation of how that process went and then planning for the next year. And I'm wondering if that is an entirely administrative process or if there are metrics or methodologies for citizen engagement in uh, evaluating how the cycle went and how it could be improved. A lot of how we're talking about PV in our class is about it being iterative. And so I'm wondering if there are any functions between cycles um, where you can kind of look at both the content of PD and the structure of that process. Yeah, yeah, there is. So we did a survey um, of everybody who participated, uh, people that voted, people on the steering committee and budget delegates uh, when we evaluated our last cycle. So we did a broad survey. We hired uh, North Carolina Central University consultants to um, come in and evaluate the process and think about, you know, how well did we do on centering equity? How well did we do on making sure that these projects actually met the needs of the community that we were um, that we were most concerned about? How well did we meet our goals? Um, and so, yeah, there is community engagement around that evaluation process, and but it's mostly done by the steering committee and the staff. Um, in consultation with consultants. And then the reports are brought back to city council. And then we all discuss what changes we want to make, how we want to improve for the next year. Because the second cycle was so different because of COVID, we didn't get to implement a lot of the advice that we were given because we just had a very different um, kind of PD engagement. But we, uh, when we go back and we look at, you know, the evaluation for cycle one and cycle two, we'll be, we'll try to synthesize that feedback um, and that evaluation into coming up with what the plan is going to look like for cycle three. And it is, you know, it's exciting to be able to do, you know, to do the thing over and over and try to improve on it each time. Um, a lot of cities do PB every year. We decided that that, you know, that that was not something that we could, uh, could take on, like doing the voting process every year. And at, at first I was, um, at first, I was opposed to it. I wanted to do it every year, but I think that this process is actually a lot better, giving us time to evaluate and reflect and giving our staff the, the space to actually implement the projects rather than have to be thinking about, okay, let me get rid let me get ready for this next cycle while we're still, you know, trying to implement stuff from cycle one. Um, I'm seeing a question in the chat. Is the evaluation report available on the web? I think it is. If it's not, let me know. I can email it to Andrew and uh, he can send it out to y'all. Other questions? Um, yeah, so my question is just related to affordable housing and kind of how you weigh the stakeholders, um, like the DHA, um, various nonprofits, private companies, and then also how you balance that with um, community input. Mm -hmm. Um, so let me, let me talk about the bond as kind of a example of, of how we might manage that kind, those kind of stakeholder engagements and community engagements around a specific, um, around a specific goal. So we had been, um, talking about thinking about doing an affordable housing bond for a while. And when we decided to get serious about it, um, the mayor, Mayor Shul and our community development department um, directors came up, they, they kind of consulted with community organizations, affordable housing providers, um, affordable housing developers, market rate housing developers, DHA, you know, kind of all the players 
to get a good to try to get a good sense of what the need was in the community if we were to and and what the capacity was so we have you know we we have a limited capacity of construction work that can be done right in Durham at a particular time and one of our concerns was we would put out this bond but there wouldn't be the capacity within the construction community to actually build and repair the affordable housing using the money um, so we came up with this plan kind of with all of that consultation um, they came up with a plan to put together a 160 million dollar five-year housing affordable housing plan that would and and then calculated how much money we already had coming in through our federal allocations and through our two cent tax levy, which raises about $6 million a year and came up with a gap for like what we thought we could implement over that five years and what the funding gap was. And that funding gap was about $95 million. Um, after that, we put together a board, a community board, whose job it was to evaluate that plan and make any recommendations that we wanted to see before the plan got put to the voters. And then there was a bond pack, essentially a political action committee campaign that went out into the community and lobbied people to vote for the bond um, and, and you know, went to community events and meeting basically as if the bond were a candidate, like this bond wrote yes on the bond, there were signs, there were t-shirts, um, a whole big community campaign around around voting yes on the bond. And we were able to get 76% of the vote, um, which is really exciting. And I think really showed the community's commitment to affordable housing and the, and the level of concern around the current situation. Um, we have also had conversations recently about we, we just this year put the tax increase to pay for the bond into the budget last year was when we had planned to do it but with COVID and general economic uncertainty we decided to delay it for a year um, and we're now starting to see actual projects that are that are bond you know partially bond or like this five-year plan funded coming out of the ground so we just approved um a project we just got tax credits for a project that dha is doing to redevelop the liberty uh, liberty street community into several um, new apartment buildings and have more you know, concentrate folks have more folks and have more open space also on the site uh, and so all the dha projects are also doing dha resident engagement and there are federal requirements around um, moving public housing tenants, making sure that people have the right to return to the new building once it's built um, and those kinds of things. So there's also engagement that happens with DHA tenants and the DHA board over on that side. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot. <laughs> and balancing all those interests and all those people is, is tricky, of course. Um, I think that we, you know, we do a pretty good job, but there, we could always do better and there's always more that we can do to make sure that people are in the conversation and having their voices heard um, and that we are actually taking people's input into account when we then make the decision or move forward with a project. Uh, so we were reading about PB in other countries and other states and we know that obviously it's growing uh, nationwide globally and that some other uh, countries really give a lot more money to the program. Uh, yeah. There's places like Portugal where they have a nationwide PB uh, program. And so I was curious, what do you see as the long-term vision for like growth in Durham in the PB program? Could this take up a more substantial chunk of the city budget moving forward? And then uh, what, what are the prospects maybe of a really sometime down the road, uh, statewide or even maybe a nationwide TV process? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, the conference that I went to to talk about the program here in Durham was in Barcelona, and we learned a lot about um, a lot of what other countries were doing and, uh, you know, a group of project from, I think it was Taiwan, um, was doing really cool stuff with engaging like migrants and refugees. Um, there were some, there was a PB program, I think in, in a city in France where something like they put like 25 or 30% of the budget before the voters. Um, in, in the US, you know, we, our, our first 
process was like one half of 1% of the budget. And people said that was too much money. <laughs> like our staff recommendation was for even less than that. So I think it's really, it's really such a new concept in, um, in the US. People still see it as kind of an experimental fringe thing. Whereas in, you know, countries in Europe and Latin America, it's just become a more accepted, accepted part of the culture. I think that um, over time, I would love to see the budget grow. I would love to see the, uh, the voting base grow have more people who are, um, have more of the folks who are eligible to vote actually be engaged in vote. We, there are some PB processes, particularly in, in districts of like New York and Chicago, where PB actually over-represents marginalized people, where their local elections under-represent marginalized people. And like, that's my goal, right? I want to over-represent people who do not have the ability to participate in other kinds of civic engagement where where their vote really matters. I want to overrepresent youth. I want to overrepresent immigrants, um, low-income people. That that's really my goal is to have a space where where people who don't usually have access to these civic engagement um, mechanisms and tools are able to have their voices heard. Um, I don't know, you know, if we'll ever get in the U.S. to the kind of um, the kind of budget allocations and the kind of participation that. Um, that they have in Europe, I think it's you know, it, it's it's a very different kind of political culture. But having you know having a participatory process around um, some of these like one-time federal allocations, like if the state were to be like, let's do you know let's do a public participatory budgeting process around how we're going to spend some of our federal grant money, that would be awesome. Or some of the money, you know, the state has this huge rainy day fund that they're still sitting on, despite like the very intense thunderstorm going on outside with this pandemic, right? Um, so I think there are, there are definitely statewide opportunities for there to be more um, more engagement, and also in other cities around um, around the state and around the southeast. I've helped advise a new PB program in Atlanta, Georgia, um, a new program in um, another city in South Carolina. So it is growing in strength and interest, and I hope it'll it'll continue growing. I have a follow-up question to something sure. you just said about um, overrepresenting groups who are marginalized from other venues of civic engagement. Well, I think one of the um, sort of hypotheses behind participatory budgeting is that it becomes an access point for other forms of civic participation. Yeah. Uh, and I'm wondering if you've seen that in Durham. Have you know has it generated uh, successive engagements and other other uh, public fora by folks who you know aren't necessarily voters or marginalized from, um, from you know kind of more commonly thought of uh, modes of participation. Yeah, I can say yes in small ways. Um, some of our budget delegates have applied to be on city boards and commissions, for example. Um, what I think we'd want to see is higher levels of like vote of voting in municipal elections that like people who do PD are then more likely to vote for city council and the mayor as well. We haven't measured that. We'd have to figure out a way to measure that. Um, but I can say that folks who have been um, the 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 people who we've engaged the most closely are that group of 100 budget delegates who were really doing like for four months, really digging in and doing the meat of the proposal development and project development work. And a number of those people have continued to be engaged and involved in city government and taken on leadership roles in boards and commissions and or run for office, those kinds of things. But at this point, it's all anecdotal. We don't have we don't right now have a tool to measure whether that's happening, but we would like it to happen. Um, and I think we could, I think we could figure out um, ways to measure it in the future. Um, did you, uh, first. Hey, Jillian, it's Gunther. So glad to hear you again. Hi, good to see you. Hey. Yeah, um, so my question builds right on this last question. It's about, um, I guess the thinking of Durham as a single community is lovely and important and thinking about the undocumented people who are key members of this great community, not only the work they do, the tax they pay, all of that um, largely unaccounted for contributions. So I'm wondering um, whether you've seen or have you measured, and this is dangerous perhaps, um, undocumented uh, residents participation. Why? Yeah. And then is there a way in which the whole process could be more uh, directly representative of their needs um, rather than simply civic needs? So I'm thinking of like 
if you think of the projects that could really help uh, people who are afraid of being deported at any moment, like what kind of sure. community projects could there be that would help them, that would reduce that fear uh, for safety? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And the the quick answer is no, we didn't because we didn't want people to have to reveal that they were undocumented. And that was a that was a tricky there, there were a lot of questions that we had to answer as we were designing the process about how to measure, how much to measure, how restrictive do we want the voting to be? Like, you know, some folks were like, well, we have to confirm that people live in Durham, but there's no way to do that if, without, you know, asking somebody for their personal information, their name, their address. And we didn't want that information on file particularly when we, were when we were designing this program under the Trump administration, we didn't even want the city to have a list of people with their names and addresses because we didn't want that list to fall into, you know, fall into the hands of the Trump administration and then be used to target um, immigrants in Durham. So there were a lot of concerns around even how like data collection and can that data ever even be safe and secure? And would people participate if they knew that they had to give us personal information um, that they were concerned about and that we couldn't actually guarantee them would remain confidential because we are legally bound to the state and the federal government who were being run by people who do not share our values. Um, so we did not measure that. What we did do was try to engage um, people, Spanish speaking immigrants, uh, in a in a direct and um and and like deep way through the process that we were having already so we had a person from um from neighborhood improvement services who was bilingual and bicultural who ran a number of idea collection and voting and engagement sessions for spanish speakers and there was a spanish only um, budget committee of budget delegates that dealt with some of the projects and we so we were able to do that engagement for folks in their native language we don't know whether those folks were undocumented or documented immigrants um, and uh, but that but that was a successful successful intervention we also paid attention to language um, and translation and making sure that you know our online events had interpretation and um, so that folks who don't speak English were were able to participate. We're we're now thinking about we we've we've moved the needle a lot over the last four years on on inclusion of Spanish and in our kind of language justice plan, mostly thanks to having a Spanish speaking bilingual and bicultural city council member. We're now starting to think too even about other languages and and working with our refugee resettlement providers to. Um, to figure out how we do things in Arabic and Swahili and other languages that are commonly spoken by um, by immigrants and refugees coming to Durham. Uh, we've had a couple of meetings around COVID relief that were uh, in three languages, English, Spanish, and Swahili, or English, Spanish, and Arabic, and hope to continue to do um, that kind of um, language engagement to be able to engage undocumented people, Im all immigrants, but undocumented immigrants, um, particularly because, of course, you know, those, they are the folks who are, who are most left out of other political processes. Um, but yeah, the, the, me the measuring it is tricky, and we just, we didn't want to have electronic data or sheets of paper around with people's information, because we, um, we just could imagine like ice barging in and taking it, you know, it's a little bit less worrisome now, though, I think, you know, Biden has continued largely Trump's problematic immigration policies, um, but we're not seeing raids. And I think that the tenor of the conversation is a lot less terrifying. Like we were actually worried that we would be, um, that we would be legally required to turn over our documents so that the administration could hunt people down. And I don't, I'm not worried about that now, but I am still, you know, want to be very conscious of people's privacy and their, and their concerns. Another question? Yeah, you mentioned um, how a lot of times people whose ideas may not be accepted for participatory budgeting um, may feel discouraged by the process and it's hard to keep them engaged. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about how you go about dealing with that and how you help ensure that they do stay engaged in the future? Yeah, honestly, we have not figured that out yet. Um, we have had, for, for the most part, I think groups that have not, organizations that have not been funded or groups that where their, you know, where their proposals haven't got to the, the voting stage of the process or like went on the ballot but didn't get funded. Um, have been have been gracious about it and have been um, 
have accepted the process, you know, that we, that as part of the democratic process, there are, you know, there are going to be winners and losers. Um, and, and so that's, you know, that's part of, that's part of what PB entails. And I, and it is, and it is problematic. Like that's my least favorite part of this is that people's pride, there's going to be voting, which means people's projects are going to lose. Um, and then you have all these really good ideas and, and what do you do with them? I think that, you know, there is hope that if there are other good ideas that could be funded from pots of money that are outside PB, that that's something that the city could do. But to my knowledge, we have not been able to do uh, anything like that yet. And we do have some people who are really unhappy about, you know, pe people whose projects weren't funded who are really unhappy and who are publicly disparaging the process um, as a result of their projects not being funded, saying that this is inequitable, that it's unfair, you know, and, and, for, and not framing it as my project didn't get funded and now I'm upset, but the people who are doing it are work for organizations whose projects didn't get funded. And we had that for round one, and now we have it again for round two. Um, I don't think we're doing a good job at figuring out how to um, how to deal with that, how to deal with the problem of people who, who are disgruntled or discouraged by the process um, and, and how to, uh, how to move forward and how, how to continue to engage those people or how to at least like, uh, how to at least not allow that disaffection to become a threat to the functioning of the program, because, you know, people are, uh, it, it, it is possible for people who feel like they have been wronged by the program to, um, to create narratives that lead to other people feeling like this wasn't a good idea, that it wasn't done well, et cetera, um, to, to build kind of a misinformation engine that um, that negatively impacts the work overall. So yeah, it's a big problem. I honestly don't know. I don't know how um, how to deal with it. It's something that we think about a lot and are trying to figure out. But yeah, we don't have a good answer yet. So we have a, a question in the chat. How many people voted in the team process, and how did voter turnout for PD compare to elections? Yeah. So in our in cycle one. We had just over 10,000 people vote. 10,000 was our goal. I think we got like 10,040. <laughs> so just like sneaked by it, which was really great. Um, how many people vote? Voter turnout in, in regular elections varies greatly. Um, for municipal elections, I think our last municipal election, the turnout was in the 20,000 range. So we got about half as many people vote in PB as voted for mayor and city council, probably a little less than half. For the process that we did during COVID, it was a little bit different and we didn't count, we, we had three different sections. Um, and so we didn't, we don't have, we don't know how many people voted um, in, in cycle two because people may have voted for in one category and not in the other ones or may have voted in all three and we didn't capture that. Um, we should have, and it's, uh, it's, it's one of the, it's one of the um, failings of, of cycle two that we don't have that data. Um, but we, you know, we we set the 10,000 vote goal based on um, for for the first cycle based on a calculation of like how how many people were eligible, how many votes we thought we could get from the school system, and how much outreach we uh, were able to do. I think that um, you know, and and we're hoping that that will grow over time. So with COVID, it was hard. We just don't know what happened, but I'm hoping that in the in the next cycle we'll be able to exceed that 10,000 vote um, margin and get you know get to get to 12 or 15,000 votes if we can. We have another question in the room. Elizabeth. Okay. Hello. Um, for a bit of background um, to my question, I actually work part time for the city of Durham under Andrew. And, oh, cool. Um, so I, I wanted to follow up on your point on language minority populations in the city of Durham. And from what I've noticed, um, kind of within the city staff, there are only a few Spanish speakers, including myself, yep. who kind of constantly get this work of working with Hispanic and Latino communities placed on top of them. And now I, there's an addition of a language access coordinator, I believe, but I still think the capacity for doing um, engagement to undocumented populations, Latino populations in the city of Durham is still very low. So how is the city council prioritizing this? How is city council even prioritizing that meetings 
and the kind of minute meetings for steering committees and public information is accessible, which at the moment greatly depends on whether or not there's a Spanish speaker in the department. Yep, definitely. Um, so we are uh, uh, the language access coordinator there. The big part of their job is to come up with a language access plan and that we want that plan to address all of those issues. How do we make sure that we have interpretation and access at all city meetings, including our boards and commission meetings? Because right now, if you want an interpreter, you can get one for, for city council. We have interpreters regularly available at like the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Commission, but for all the other boards, you're out of luck. So we want to make sure that we are able to um, have interpretation available at all those meetings. We have been bringing in interpretation more for um, for some of our like bigger, more broadly public facing and like public interest processes. So our safety and wellness task force has just contracted with a language justice firm to do translation and interpretation and, and just consulting on how we make that space accessible um, to people who speak other languages. That's the first time we've done that for a border commission. Um, and so, and, and I'm excited about continuing to do that kind of, um, that kind of engagement. We've also hired uh, jointly with the county an immigrant and refugee coordinator position whose job is to kind of be like a front door um, for immigrants and refugees seeking city and county services. So I'm hopeful that that will also kind of illuminate some of the gaps that we have. But you know, you're absolutely right. Like we don't are the, the resources are very limited. We, you know, there there was a there have been council meetings where we relied on council member Caballero to translate, which is ridiculous. Um, so we are figuring that out. There has been progress. There still needs to be a lot more progress um, until we get to the point that we where we need to be. And honestly, for Spanish, at least, we are really behind where federal law says we need to be because we the population of Spanish speaking people in Durham is high enough that we um, that we hit some some federal requirements regarding um, regarding access. Things like we should have bilingual signs in all of our facilities and our website should probably be running more than Google Translate. Um, so yeah, def, you know, it, it's it's all very much in progress, but we we are not where we need to be yet. Oh, I have another question. Hi, it's Zoe. Um, I noticed in your original bio that you gave your story as moving to Durham when you started school at uh, Duke. And I'm curious, recognizing the complexity of the relationship between Duke and Durham and that Duke students are transient, are a transient population. How do you see Duke's engagement with PV and whether you want us to be voting or you want us to be engaged in Duke, Durham communities and how what the objectives of that process are for Duke students and getting yeah. engaged. Yeah, that's a great question. We definitely want Duke students to be engaged. We did not prioritize Duke students for engagement. And for some of the, you know, for the reasons that you said, transient population, um, largely high income population. We we felt that um, our limited engagement resources needed to go to the places where we were least likely to get engagement. And we felt that if Duke students wanted to participate, it would be very easy for them to participate. Um, so I've, you know, I've given talks like this before on campus. Um, we, you know, put stuff out broadly to the community, but our engagement focus was not was not Duke undergrads or any other college students, honestly, even like Central or, or um, Durham Tech, where they're where the populations are um, lower income and more um, heavily people of color, we didn't prioritize engagement for them either. I think that if, um, you know, if somebody on campus wanted to do some kind of PB engagement on campus, that would be really great. And we would very much welcome it. Um, it's just that we don't have the resources to, um, to dedicate to that ourselves. But Duke students are absolutely encouraged to um, be budget delegates, to submit ideas, to vote in the process, and to be engaged um, however y'all want to be. There's one more question in the chat. How do you ensure that people only vote once? Yeah, uh, we don't. <laughs> so we sort of do. We require them to give us an email address, but obviously somebody can go make another email address and, and vote again. Um, we, we had to balance accessibility with security, and we decided to lean on the accessibility side because we wanted the process to be as open as possible. And it's honestly a pretty small amount of money um and all the projects are good <laughs> so whatever you know any any 
all of the projects getting funded would be awesome. Um, we we only want people from Durham to vote. Like we we want only Durham residents to be engaged, but we didn't feel like there was enough risk of um, of people stuffing the ballot boxes, you know, metaphorically, um, to to put a whole lot of security a lot of security on it. We have gotten criticized for that. It was an intentional decision. Um, we considered that people might vote twice, that people outside of Durham might vote, but we decided that making it as easy as possible for residents to participate was our priority. Any other questions? This is a quick question, but what to you has been the most valuable, or I guess, your favorite thing that you've gotten out of the PD process so far over cycles one and two? Yeah, I think the best thing was in cycle one, when we had the budget delegates um, working on developing the projects, the level of like deep engagement that those folks were able to get and the knowledge of how the city works was really awesome. Um, they were, wor you know, working in teams on on specific committees. So we had like a parks and rec committee and a transportation committee and a youth committee, those kinds of things. I don't know if those were actually the committees. Don't don't call me on that. <laughs> but we had them working like in these committees and they were coming to City Hall and having meetings and talking to city staff and doing community engagement um, and just really invested in the project for for that period of like three to four months where they were. Um, where they were doing the proposal. And I felt like those folks were able to get a really good experience in, um, in municipal government, municipal leadership and civic engagement out of that process. Um, and that was, I, and you know, we would be like walking around city hall and there would be budget delegate committees like meeting in literally every meeting room and like open space in city hall. And so it was just really cool to see community coming together and really working on, on making the project successful. I think that was, that was my favorite part. And then my second favorite thing was just all the youth stuff, um, doing idea collection sessions and voting sessions with young people. Our office on youth was really helpful in recruiting and getting young people to participate. Um, I got to talk to a couple of high school classes about PV and try to encourage the students to get involved in vote and being able to tell a 13 year old like no your vote actually matters in this process your vote counts it's not the kids vote election where they'll announce who won but it doesn't matter you know it doesn't count for anything it's just like yippee you voted this is actually like you are actually able to make decisions about your city um, and a lot of the young folks that we talked to were really excited about that about having the first opportunity to really cast a vote for um, for something where their where their vote really counted i think we'll make that the last question Julian, thank you so much for your time and your insight. Really appreciate you spending the afternoon with us. Um, thanks to everybody here for your questions and for just getting the conversation. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate your time. And yeah, feel free to get in touch um, if you want to get more involved in PB or anything else that the city is up to. All right. Thank you so much, Julian. Bye. Thank you. Bye.